Welcome to Renator Chronicles Podcast. I'm Ethan Taylor. And I'm Dustin Jelly. Our hope is to inspire new and old hunters alike. We hope you can join us on this journey of lessons that we have, are, and will learn through the world of hunting. Welcome, everybody, to Venator Chronicles Podcast. Here we are. Back again. Back again. Today, we have a very special guest. His name is Cade Mosh. Cade, say hello to the people. Hello. Hello, people. Oh, hello, what guys. a beautiful voice. We're oh, all jealous. Yeah. We're all jealous. Oh, very man. raspy. Very jealous. Oh, man. Touches the soul. Anyways, uh, the reason we brought Cade on today is um, we were hoping to get both you and your brother, Quinn, as well. Uh, but we brought Kate on here today uh, to learn a little bit about deer farms because we don't have the slightest clue of what goes into that and what that all entails for you. And I mean, basically, we're pretty much a bank blank slate at this moment. I mean, we've nice. probably got the the regular stereotypical information you just see in general, but we wanted to like actually get into the 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 root of it or like really, I want to know about your experience with it and like what's gotten you into it. And so maybe we'll just start there. And so, yeah. well, let's uh, let's, let's just kind of give a, a five minute uh, kind of brief overview of who you are um, and kind of where you got to where you are today. Okay, man, yeah, that's, that's a, I know it's a condenser. Yeah, yeah you can have hunting be the main theme if you want, and then how that maybe led to even the, the yeah, deer farm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, yeah, it would be nice if Quinn was here too, because yeah. you know, if I give like half answers, <laughs> it's because I'm like, oh. Because your better half is missing. Oh, get yes, it. he's missing. Oh, okay. But no, anyways, um, yeah, I mean, hunting, fishing is everything. I don't have any other hobbies. Never had other hobbies growing up or anything else. And deer hunting being the, you know, the, the pinnacle yeah. of hunting, whitetail hunting, you know, mm. out of everything that I've hunted so far anyways. So anyways, you know, we're deer nuts. And that's why we got into deer farming mm. is to experience it all, you know, at yeah. its like fullest potential, being around deer all the time, yeah. 24 seven. So, yeah. So like when you, even younger, like what did you grow up in a family that, that, uh, hunts a lot or like, is it, I mean, was it like everyone automatically did this or were you guys like, especially into it? Like how many, I mean, maybe how many siblings do you have? Yeah. Or has it been just a big part of it? Oh, dude, yeah. I mean, you know, totally grew up hunting. <clears throat> Wasn't even a question. You know, like, my dad hunted, his whole family hunted, my mom, her whole family hunted, everybody hunted. So, and it wasn't even something that you had to get forced to do. It was like, when dad would go hunting, you know, like, he'd come home at night, and we're, or, you know, in the, after dark or whatever, and we're, like, sitting out the window, like, watching, like, Oh my gosh, is there deer legs in the back? Is there deer? You know, like you're just like that amped up and you're only like, you know, six years old. Oh yeah. my gosh, there's deer legs in the back. Is it a buck or a doe? You know, type <laughs> deal. like, let's get out. You know, so it's like, it's weird how it's just like instilled in you. It's not like my dad had to be like, oh, you know, you have to hunt. Or, <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, comes out. So, so really, with, so it's like in your guys' DNA. Basically. It's in your it's DNA. In. You know, and then, yeah, and then you just build on that, right? You just, you know, your dad has these hunting tactics. Well, then along comes like modern hunting tactics mm -hmm. with like trail cameras and all this stuff. And, mm -hmm. you know, and all these different, you know, the technology and yeah. all that. And then you even build on that and you're like, well, I don't want to just hunt. Yeah. But I want to take it to the next level. You know, right? Like you guys have taken it kind of to a next level by like starting a podcast, right? Yeah. 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 You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's it's fair. like, it's not enough to just like, I want to hunt. I want to be like, you know, around it all the time. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, for us, it was like, you know, we stumbled across this deer farming thing and, and hunting preserve thing. And we're like, yeah, like <laughs> all the time, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that, that, I mean, that's just like a small piece of what built up to it is just, you know, always being out in the woods hunting, mm -hmm. always being out. You so, know. so did you, did you start out rifle hunting or archery hunting? Like what, what was the main thing? And then how did that kind of evolve? Did you end up like, was it someone else who got you into archery or did you, I mean, where did you start with that? Um, you know, started out, well, my first deer was with a gun, you know, sitting in the deer stand with my dad, you know, and, and, uh, my uncle pushes out this little nub and buck to us or whatever. And I whip oh, around and shoot Oh, on a deer drive. It. Nice. Yeah, yeah. My dad hands me his gun or whatever. Oh, all right, take it, you know, poof, you know. But, I mean, I've always wanted to be involved in every aspect of hunting. Mm -hmm. Gun, 
bow, muzzleloader, deer, grouse, tur- it doesn't matter. Like, you know, as soon as I could pick up a wrist, ro- shoot a wrist rocket, it was like, kill everything with a wrist rocket, <laughs> you know? So it's not like, oh, I started out just gun hunting or just yeah. bow hunting. And then it was like, my dad was like, you know, hey, if you can shoot a bow, go try to kill something, you know? So yeah. it was like, dude, pick bow hunting, you know, you know, freaking... When when I was like twelve or whenever it was, you start hunting. Yeah. You know, I mean, I walked out to the same deer stand every single day, like September fifteenth <laughs> to December thirty first. Like, not really, you know, under the guidance of my dad a little bit when yeah. you know, but like if he's at work or whatever, he you was know, like before school going to the same deer stand. Yeah, I mean that hardcore from the time we were like little kids, you know. So yeah, I think I'm starting to see a common theme with like. The when you enter into hunting, at least in our generation here, um, it seems like there's this common theme of it started out as like get out there. And I mean, you came into it a little bit later, Dusty. So yeah, like a lot later. Yeah, you know, yeah. But like 20, I think like <laughs> 27 years later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think like with our parents, just in general, like if you're starting out at that really young age, it seems like that was the mentality was like you go out and you sit until it happens. Yeah. And and yep. it wasn't like tactics and like thinking like through every single detail maybe. Yeah. But it was like it, it like but it it has this like nice foundation of you have that mental toughness to just grind it out. Yeah, dude. My first year when I was 12, I seen 3 deer. <laughs> and I sat every day of the season almost. Oh my goodness. So it's like, yeah, I mean, you you know my dad would teach me tactics, but like I said, you know, he's there maybe hunting on the weekend or something like that. So yeah. the rest of the week I'm just out there wrong wind direction, <laughs> wrong everything, but yet you're just out there grinding it out like 13 yeah. years old just like shivering in a deer stand like maybe just maybe that squirrel coming through the woods will magically turn into a deer <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> you it know what I'm saying? no so. idea how a deer walks because you saw three yeah so. exactly you know she's <laughs> like yeah deers crash deer crash through the woods right yep but when it's that instilled into you you just keep going yeah you just keep grinding it out day in day out and mm-hmm. then you learn as you go you know and well it's like i don't know if it's like the rite of passage or just knowing the payoff is like that feeling of like even sharing that feeling when someone else comes home with the deer yeah and it's just this huge celebration basically that's exactly it. Yep. Or is it that personal payoff? I think there's like got to be a part of both of it. Well, it's part of both. But well, when you're young and you're growing up, right, you see somebody else come home with that deer. Yeah. And you're like, oh my gosh, I can't wait till I can do that. You know, like someday, yes. oh, that's going to be me, the, all the glory, <laughs> you know. And and then when, so you're like looking forward to that. And then it's like, you know, your little body is getting worn down day in, day out. And then eventually when you kill that first deer, right, oh, man. you know, you're just like, or first animal, it doesn't have to be a deer. It could be anything, you know. Yeah. I mean, you start out on squirrels and chipmunks, mm-hmm. and then you just work your way up the ladder, and then that just has got you hooked. Like, yeah, and then you learn there's seasons for those animals. After yeah. <laughs> you're like, oh, <laughs> hey, wait a yeah. second, <laughs> it didn't matter. It was oh, just like, man. yeah, yeah. When you're that early on, it's like if you got a wrist rocket, it's like I earned it. Whatever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that that whole premise growing up. And then also the farming aspects of things. I love farming. I love farm work. And so with, yeah, part of that was that, did you guys actually have like farm? I know you had like chickens and, and sheep and stuff. So yeah. what does the farm like look, look like for you? You know, my parents weren't like super hardcore farmers, but we had like everything, you know, we had cows, goats, horses, you know, like a little bit of everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that I love farm work. Mm -hmm. Like to me, it's like so satisfying. Like, dude, a freshly plowed field, weird. But it's like, (laughs) so like, you know, to like look over that, it's just like, oh man, like there's not a better feeling almost. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you combine that with the deer and deer hunting, the animal husbandry, Mm -hmm. it's just like, it's so fun and it's so rewarding, you know, and, and satisfying. Um, but, but the main reason why we got into the hunting or the, uh, the deer farming was, um, the hunting aspect of it and the chance to, I would say, you know, and Quinn might have a different answer. There's probably multiple reasons, but probably one of the number one reasons is to manage deer that we care so much about the way that we best see fit. Interesting. You know, so so how long have you guys been deer farming? Um, kind of, yeah, kind of walk us through that process of when you guys got going, how long ago, and yeah, what that process was even like. 
It, um, let's see here. Well, the whole thing started, let's see, I'm 29. I think I was 23 when I decided like, I want to do this. And we, we, I knew a little bit about deer farming. Well, I knew it was an industry. I knew about high fence hunting. I knew that that was an industry, but I didn't really know a whole lot about it. It was like, okay, it's like this thing, you know, right? Yeah. And it wasn't until we we were trying to manage our property. My parents had 150 acres, prime deer habitat. Mm. And, but we didn't really know how to manage it growing up, right? The modern managed tactics, all this and that, you know? So we, we want, we, we, but as we learned about that, as we got older, and then we could help my dad out with more stuff, you know, rather than just relying on him to do everything, <laughs> you know, but like, you know, we wanted to manage that property, 150 acres, prime territory, you know, mm-hmm. so we, we would start managing, we planted like corn one year and stuff. And that was like, oh, all these great benefits, you know, but it didn't matter how well you managed it you were never going to see the results you wanted to see because there was too many things going against you. The neighbors would shoot all the small bucks. They won't let you shoot the bears. They won't let you shoot the wolves. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's just too many. And the deer numbers, the deer numbers are too low. There's no age structure. We killed some nice bucks off that property um, throughout many years. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're not going to kill a nice buck every year. And even and I don't expect to kill a nice buck every year. But, you know, you're not going to get that off of when the deer numbers are so low where 150 acres of prime habitat is only holding a few deer. Ooh, and yeah. then if the age structure is off, right? So if you only got one spike buck, one two-and-a-half-year-old, and one four-and-a-half-year-old or something like that, you know, yeah. on your property, and you say you, you get lucky enough to kill that three-and-a-half, four-and-a-half-year-old deer... Well, then there's an age gap because there's no structure. Mm. So th- th- now all of a sudden you don't have any more four and a half year olds the next year because mm. there, there was no, the age structure and the herd is all messed up and there's no deer anyways. And you can't take any does off of your property <laughs> because you're trying to build your herd. Yeah, yeah. So if you do kill a mature doe to try to even out that, that herd balance a little bit. Yeah. Now you just lost like two fawns next year. Yeah. And you're going... Okay, we literally have to hunt someplace else because 150 acres is still not enough property to have a quality deer herd. And not that you're going to hold a herd on 150 acres, yeah. but just have quality deer coming and going. Yeah, yeah. Now you put four or five hunters out there, like my family members, you know, me, my two brothers, my dad, if one of my sisters or mom hunts or something like that, you know, um, if you did that and you're all going after maybe one mature buck mm-hmm. if you're lucky <laughs> so then when we realized this so you could spend essentially all the money in the world putting in these prime food plots and deer stands and this and that and you're still not going to get that herd structure the way that we think it should be managed interesting so yeah do you mind if i go back a little bit on as far as what you're saying with, oh yeah uh, yeah i don't care so uh you said you mentioned like you're like yeah i know there's like high fence hunting operations Mm -hmm. so for me just in as a broad statement like that carries negative connotations with it yeah did that did that did that for you initially was that a is that something that you guys had to think about or we're like wait uh we you know did you guys dislike high fence before this or like how do you view it um where it's not negative i guess because for me not being a part of one not whatever else how do you you know, did you have that even in your mind, the negative you side know, of it? A hundred percent honesty, no. Uh, interesting. I okay. had I had zero. Um, um, uh, I don't know what the word is. I I didn't I didn't care one way or the other. I knew what a high fence hunting ranch was vaguely, mm-hmm. like most people. Yeah. Vaguely. Yeah. Most people have some sort of disillusioned idea of what it is. I'm I'm most people. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> I have no problem um, admitting that. So I, I knew what it was, but it, it didn't interest me. Hmm. And yet I wasn't against it because why would I be against something I don't know anything about? Mm. So now hold on. But, There's but, some wisdom we could all take in. Just oh, yeah. Soak Put that in. That. Yeah. That is. Uh, so you didn't you didn't have the thought. I'm just going to dig into this just a second. You didn't have the thought like, oh, you killed a 200 inch deer. And then when they said it was in a high fence, you didn't go. Oh, it means a little less because yeah. that's where I think I think probably myself. And some other people might be. Yeah. You I follow th- what I'm saying? Like just yeah. that, that general, like not understanding it. Like you're saying, that's where my mind goes. Yeah. And I think people have that, but, 
and, and you know, if people think that, well, honestly, who really cares? It's up to the hunter, right? That's fair. Yeah, yeah. I mean, here's the thing. You know, here, here's what I compare it to. Okay, my grandpa thinks the only way to catch trout is with hand-tied flies. Okay, if he sees you fishing a river with a rapala, he will literally come up to you and say, those blank and things should be outlawed. <laughs> okay? Yeah, yeah. So if Ethan wants to hunt behind a high fence or not behind a high fence, I honestly don't care. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Why? Well, you know, and you know, I I used to see this one hunting group thing that or DVD I used to watch. They had this thing like say no to high fence. You know why? Isn't this America? Mm-hmm. I mean, that might be a broad statement, but aren't you free to call hunting what you call hunting? Hunting. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people though struggle with the idea of fair chase. Well, exactly. But yeah. what's fair chase? Right. Well, I think that's where you get into the weeds, right? Exactly. So like, right. So what would be, so would you call, right. So, I mean, if we were to work some so let's, disillusion. Let's, let's, let's start, circle back around to this a little bit later because I think this will. Yeah, this will end up being like the yeah. rest of the podcast. <laughs> yeah, just talking about this. I love it. Here jump. we go. Let's get into the controversial topic. <laughs> Tell me all your thoughts so I can tweet about it. <laughs> so I can tweet. <laughs> Got to get those hits. I Got to get those likes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, you oh. are a... You're a hunting bunny. We, we well, let, let, me, let me let me stir the pot. <laughs> let yeah. me let me stir the pot. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, my so yeah, kind of kind of wrapping back around from Ethan's wrap <laughs> around, yeah. uh, to like as you're getting this going, you obviously you know no thoughts you know uh, for or against. So yeah, kind of what was that like development? You yeah. Know? Okay. Yeah. So back to the development, I guess is no uh, n- no thoughts for or against. We just see that, okay, how are we going to... And, and another part of it is the financial aspect, right? Like I said, you could spend tens of thousands of dollars into making better habitat for animals, but if the deer aren't there because you can't manage the other aspects, you can't manage the wolves, you can't manage the bears, the DNR sets the limit on what kind of deer you can and can't harvest. So now you're you're constrained how you think the deer herd should be on your property by everybody else's or you know your game management or whatever their systems, right? So am I going to go spend ten thousand dollars on lime fertilizer seed, tr- you know, detractor? I mean, you're talking thousands of dollars into improving the habitat, but yet all the elements are fighting against me. If I see a wolf killing a deer, I'm not allowed to shoot it. If I see a bear going around snatching up fawns, I'm not allowed to shoot that either until I get a tag in nine years. <laughs> if a four-pointer walks onto my neighbor's property, it's their right to shoot it, and they shoot it. I'm not going to say anything, right? Mm-hmm. So all these things are working against you. So why would I spend all that time, energy, and money into something that I'm not going to hardly see, maybe shoot a, shoot a uh, mature buck once every you know four, five, six years? You know, I'm not going to do that, right? So, so we thought in, you know, well, how, how can we make it pay for itself? Right. Selling hunts. Hmm. There's a place down the road from us. They manage the property immaculately 720 acres for 20 years. I don't know if you guys have heard of Antler King. I'm sure you have Antler King products. Anyways, that was their testing grounds only a mile and a half from our house. They couldn't sell enough hunts on that property, you know, to basically pay the property the mortgage uh, on the yeah, property. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So we want to be able to pay for all this that we're investing into yeah. by selling hunts. Well, the only way to do that is to have deer there to hunt. Worth worth hunting. Pay worth to pay hunting. Hunt. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, for us, it's a blessing to be able to raise these deer, manage them the way that we want to, see our hard work come to fruition, and have other people go out and hunt them you know, yeah, and that so that was kind of all part of the de- development thought process. Yeah, you know, and and this is, you know, how I stumbled into this is I met this kid from Stevens Point, Wisconsin. He was like, and I was telling him a little bit about my goals and dreams. You know, as a young, you know, almost twenty three <laughs> year old, just working my heart out. You know, and uh, and he's like, yeah, so yeah, my buddy does the same thing. He's like, you want to start a a high fa- uh, a hunting ranch, and I'm like. A hunting ranch? What's that? You know, he's like, well, it's a high, it's a high fence hunting preserve, and I'm like, 
well, I don't know. Let me look into that. So then it was from literally from that minute on, it was nothing but research. Deer, um, high, you know, hunting, this and that, boom, 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 you know, and, and then you've got these other rumors, the negative rumors, like you said, you know, the negative this and that. So then you got to look into that. Well, is there any truth behind this or that or whatever, you know, into these negative rumors? And, and you know, after all the research was done and, and uh, after we had, you know, I mean, literally spent like countless hours looking into this and, and getting excited about this, it was like, yeah, this is what we want to do. There is no downside to this. It's awesome. You know, I mean, we get to be around deer. We get to manage deer. We get to manage deer. Nothing against the DNR. The DNR isn't going to tell us how to manage deer. We get to do it. We get to put in a food plot and actually see bucks come out to it rather than, you know. So, I mean, that that's that was the thought process in developing this and a lot of research i mean just you know dude videos youtube talking to people on the phone i mean anywhere from the department of egg mm-hmm. down to other deer farmers you know so and, and then once we went through that whole process of just learning then it was like okay time to time to put the work in yeah you know so so what was uh what was the process like? Was it really an arduous process, like working through the the part where I mean, did you have to work with the county? How many different like branches of the? Did you have to go like through a lot of different government branches to actually get this like approved, or was it pretty simple? Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, the the permitting and all that was pretty involved. DNR and Department of Ag being the two big ones. Okay, and the hardest part was communication to make sure you're doing everything right right because we're like we don't want to do something illegal and then yeah. also we're getting screwed in the future right so we're we're working through this with the department of ag and making sure all of our i's are dotted and our t's are crossed you know with them and then with the dnr and the two different departments don't communicate <laughs> oh my goodness so, so yeah. there yeah so and why would they it, it, Dude, it's the government. I, I Why would as, they? I, and I speak as a government worker. So. Yeah. Oh <laughs> snap! You know. So yeah. So it's like you're like trying like okay, they okay they told us this, but they told oh there's two different systems. The DNR has their own requirements, and the Department of Ag has their own requirements, and you're just trying to make sense of it all. And of course, every piece of paper you fill out is like a hundred dollars. You know. So you're like, uh huh. Yeah, Why wouldn't it be? You know. Yeah. You're basically writing on money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So now actually, and as in, uh, you know, locally, you just have to make sure you're zoned accordingly, you know, and that's something actually as of recently has been coming up with the county and stuff. And we've been going to a lot of county meetings and working with them on that. Um, they have a negative view of deer farming and, and things. So, you know, but locally, you just got to make sure you're zoned properly. Okay. And then, but then everything else is at a state level as far as fencing requirements, how you buy your deer, um, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, one thing that I actually was, I got to participate in, the one day I was out there with you guys, it was, I think you just finished, or were very close to finishing, you must have been finished, because we were going out to get rid of any animals, any deer that were on the property. Yes. Yep, right? Yep, yep. Yeah, so what? what's the idea or thought behind, like, why do you have to get rid of every single deer that's already on the property? Um, Because the state owns the deer, you do not. So they, they give you permits to kill. So they the, give you <laughs> permits to kill the deer. Wait, this this sounds a lot like uh, kind of Robin Hood esque in England. And, yeah, uh, the king owns the deer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> except they give them permits yeah. to kill any deer that's out there, right? It's yes. Like yeah. Trail. Yep. Yeah. So that's when you came out. Yeah. That's we had some kill tags, um, agriculture tags, or whatever the the DNR biologist guy gave us, and uh, he's a really good guy. Well, that's um, good. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. That, that helps Super the process. Super smart, yeah, good guy. And uh, yeah, and then we went out there and we killed the few deer. What we tried to do is we tried to push all the deer off the property before we fenced it in. But of course, you can't get all of them. Right. Because even though there's not that many, you know. Yeah. You're trying to push, like, a, we, had, we had like 190 acres. Yeah, and what we had like point, six people, so. maybe? Yeah, exactly. Like that. So you're not going to get them all off. Deer so you gotta, drive after you know. deer drive after deer drive. So we kill the, f- the few deer that were left on there. And, and then actually what they do is they make you uh, donate that meat. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah, I think uh, I don't think we were allowed to keep any of it, unfortunately, even though it's our property. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, yeah, we brought it over. They grind it up. They donate it's it. It's the so, king's deer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, it's an well, ongoing at least it's donated. joke. At least it's donated. Exactly. And not, like, thrown away. Yeah. No, no yeah. No you bring cases. it in and they grind it up and cut it up to, you know, like a, a meat processor and then mm-hmm. they donate it to a food shelf or whatever. And, well, that's yeah. good. So that's, that's all the, part of the process. It's not the worst thing then. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. Yeah, charity is always a tax write off. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> not like Canada and their their bear hunting issues right now. Oh man, so yeah. we can oh. go deep. Yeah, it's it's a rabbit hole, <laughs> dude. It's a rabbit hole. <laughs> you know. So well, what? You go ahead. Oh, sorry. I guess there's one question for clarification. So when you actually are running this deer farm, then everything in that area, your land. You, you have full management of like the, the DNR can't tell you how much or how few or yep uh, wow okay and that, that's what's that. cool about it yeah is uh you know it's totally up to us you know buck doe hunting season what we I mean even what we're going to use you know if we want to go rifle hunting in September we go rifle hunting in September wait what you know yeah so um that's all under our control because it's our property and those are our animals Hold on. We killed the state-owned animals. Hold on, hold on, hold so on. So those are our animals. This is like a big revelation. <laughs> it's a big deal. I have no clue. That's it's a operate. big deal. Hold that on, hold on. really interesting. So you can actually set the hunting season as well. Yes. So it's it doesn't have to be like within, like, you can just legit, in yeah. August, you can have a hunt. Yep. Most people, uh, you know, who have a hunting preserve usually run the normal season okay yeah or they'll do august 31st to say january 31st okay you know some people want to shoot a velvet buck yeah that's true you know and you get down to september 15th you you could shoot a velvet buck maybe you know right, it's, yeah. it's about a you know 60 40 you know type deal yeah so but some people are like i want to shoot a velvet buck i've always wanted to shoot a velvet buck mm-hmm. and you know okay august 31st You're like, if you got problem. the greenbacks man yeah that's right you know <laughs> you know and, and you know you got velvet bucks, you know, on August 31st. And then, you know, you can extend the hunting season a little bit longer too. So, so do they basically view it as like cattle in, in terms yeah. of like, we, you could kill your own cows whenever you want. Exactly. Is that essentially it, how that's it's why, kind of- that's why we uh, deal with the department of ag. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, because they, they'll, uh, they, they write most of the regulations for the deer farmers, hunting preserves. Um, they, they fall under that agricultural, um, I don't know. Yeah. They fall under agricultural. Okay. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> you know? All right. Yeah. So, man, like that, some of that stuff, I just had zero clue. Zero clue. Yeah. Which is what I expected. I mean, I came into this without knowing really anything besides Dude. the mainstream, probably complaints more than anything else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's fascinating all the things. There, There's so many intricacies to it and so much to learn. Besides the regulation side, that's the boring part, you know. Uh-huh. Um, but then you have this thing that you can mold into whatever you want it to be. You, the herd structure, the quality of deer, the even even the hunting season. The, the you know the no regulations, the no regulation hunting part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Let me let me be very clear. The regulations on the rest of it are through the roof. <laughs> So, um, you know, but the, 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 that part of it that you can control is what makes it so uh, appealing, yeah. you know, and, and so fun because that's what we want. Yeah. We wanted healthy deer, a healthy herd. And by a healthy herd, I mean herd structure, age structure, doe structure, buck structure, something nobody in Douglas County has a clue about. Okay, because the herd structure in Douglas County is so far out of whack, it's unbelievable, you know? So when you, you, and we wanted the opportunity for not only us, but other people who come hunt on our property to have the opportunity to see deer be deer, (laughs) okay? The deer you see out in the wild are the deer that are pressured by 500,000 gun hunters every season, okay? The Orange Army. The Orange Army. And I'm being serious, you know, it's because it's like, you go in the woods. How how many times have you experienced bucks fighting on your stands? Cook, 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 cook. You know, grunting, chasing does. Does communicate, bleeping back and forth. You know, and bucks grunting and and that thrill of when you hear that crashing coming. You know, how many times last season did you experience that? Which part? Uh, I'm still all searching of it. for all of that. <laughs> I've, I've exactly. had maybe one or two of those experiences. Not definitely not fighting. The grunting is about as far as it probably went. Well, and that, that's actually something really interesting because, like, I know in Minnesota, you know, one of the big complaints is we we actually unless you go down the southern Minnesota, we don't have really big bucks being 
being harvested or killed in northern Minnesota because I feel like a lot of people, a lot of people that I know, it's just, well, the first thing that's got horns, it's it's dead. And so there's there's no management of, like, how do we develop good, healthy, mature bucks that can, you know, produce other good, healthy, mature deer population. It's just if it's it's brown, it's down. If it's got horns, it's dead. Exactly. So – and maybe this is part of like as we change the circles we're in or the people we talk to. So maybe part of it's coming from that. But do you feel like there's, and I just mean like on a bigger scale even maybe, but you, it sounds like you're dealing with the people, <laughs> maybe the people that are on the other side of this. But I feel like there's been an, just a general move towards like quality deer management. There has been. I, I believe like, I there feel is. like the number for that, like people are starting to get it. It seems like, I don't know, it, like it, an overall idea of like more responsibility to what you're doing and like what's yes. going on. And, and like, I would agree. And, and I hate to do it, but I kind of credit some of that to social media because of dude, social media turns things into trends. It turns mm-hmm. hunting into trends. It turns fishing into trends. It turns traditional bows into trends. It turns hipsters. Y- yeah. Struggle stick life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dread life. Oh, gosh. Oh, my gosh. It's coming out. Absolute hipster. Dude. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, and, and quality of your management. You know, the old school method of like, put meat on the table. That's what we're out here to do. I mean, don't get me wrong. My family of five, that is all we eat is wild game, you know? Yeah. So, I'm all about putting meat on the table. But having that quality there in the word of mouth, people being able to communicate through Facebook, Instagram, whatever. And, and seeing the pictures and the stories encourages other people to be like, yeah, I want to plant a food plot. Yeah, I want to pass up that year and a half old buck. That's what it seems on the surface anyways. Well, and it seems like that it's become a richer experience for people. Like it used to, like you're saying with that meat on the table mentality where it's like if it's brown, it's down. Yeah. Like it seems like it's people are starting to like have more reverence for the actual hunting and killing and and it's not just this hoopla of like yeah or we got a deer it's all dead and 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 it's just at least at least yeah. at the high level i think i think that effect is still it's slowly trickling down because i mean yeah from what i see on social media there'd be a lot of people i follow because i mean i didn't grow up watching a lot of the the modern uh, hunting tv shows i mean a lot of that just disinterested me i just didn't care for it for so many reasons but the, a lot of people and organizations that i'm following now like that there is this shift towards yeah managing game population and not just number wise but good healthy population you know quality from, yeah, deer quality yeah deer, yeah you know i mean even even looking at like predator management yeah you know, just yeah the, under, yep. trying to understand the ecosystem i know that for me has been a huge learning lesson and learning curve in, in understanding the you know I guess the conservation side or just the you know the the management the stewardship of these these populations just like we would with cattle or anything else like how do we yeah it's like this big revelation of like oh there's actually a lot that goes into this so i, th- I think it's slowly yeah definitely it's slowly trickling out but still i would say predominantly top heavy yeah you know well and i think yeah. i think what we're seeing like you mentioned it Cade, with like the social media becoming a big part of it mm-hmm. is i think that we're starting to see it go from those old deer, the deer shows where it's like they're out there just killing monster buck and like shoving brands down your throat dur- doing, dur- uh, during that whole process, right? And then the other side of that was just what you experienced as an individual. And now with the social media becoming so big, it's like you're starting to get this more nuanced middle ground where it's like it's not just going out here and pushing a brand and, and killing a, you know, a huge monster buck every time. Mm-hmm. You're starting to see people who are. It's like, oh, it's their first kill, and it's and it's like an experience, and you could experience that with them. And I mean, you watch shows like The Hunting Public, where it's this whole learning thing, you know. And and I'm willing to like I'm watching people just fail over and er, fail over and over because because I'm interested in their experience, not the outcome of what's happening. And I don't think yeah. you're gonna push DVDs, you know, 10, 15 years ago of people not killing monster bucks all the time. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yes, I, I know what you're saying. Yep. So, but yep. but then you come into with what you're so with what you're saying as far as like Douglas County, we're going to use as our um, little model here. You're it sounds like you're running into people who are just are they you feel like they're just so disconnected or oblivious to what's really going on. Well, I you know back to well, this whole start of this is I what I said about the social media and it on the surface like I said before it seems as though quality deer management is come is is trickling down it's yeah. it's having its effect mm-hmm. on the surface 
Yeah, okay. And then every other hunter I talk to is like, well, yeah, meat buck. <laughs> yeah, I always pass up the little ones, but I needed a meat buck. I mean, every person. I'm not kidding. Like every person. And there's nothing wrong with putting meat on the table. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that on our property, we wanted quality deer. Yeah. And to get quality deer, you have to manage the deer herd. And that means not shooting a meat buck sometimes. Mm. You know, so like I said, on the surface, it seems like people are really putting this effort forward. And I believe people are. I do. I believe people, I believe the new, the next generation, our generation is doing better to have a quality deer herd and just quality, um, you know, environment altogether. Yeah. Um, but like I said, you know, when I talk to hunters, I talk to people, I read the statistics, I see what's being shot and it's still the same thing every year. Oh, uh, this fan. Well, they, they need some meat. So they shot four spikers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Dude, then yeah, they needed meat. You can definitely yeah. any on that spiker in the first place. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, well, there, it, it has to be having some effect and I, and I'll just speak from my own experiences. This is the first time not only have I ever passed on a deer I've ever like this last year of archery hunting. It's the first time I've ever seen deer within range. And I was archery hunting that I actually passed on like bucks and I've yeah. never, and I, and it was only the year before that I shot a buck. It was a five pointer. It was on a deer drive. It was the first buck I ever killed. And the very next year I'm shooting it. I'm looking at deer with my bow and I'm going, you know, not far enough along. Yes. But my yes, gu- yeah. but my personal guideline, just cause I had only killed that, you know, glorified five pointer, we'll say um, my only real guideline was it has to be something that I'm excited enough about to end my season. Yes. And so next year going in after getting an eight pointer, you know, if it's an eight pointer, that's a much bigger, you know, a lot better looking, you know, I'm not going to set the standards too, like right now, but, yeah. but the idea being like, I actually passed on really small bucks and I was like, it, it felt super good. Dude, that's what it I'm saying. It felt so good. And I did I had no idea. I was like, oh, I, I could, I look at the deer. I'm like, you, I could have had you. I got you. I would have had you today. And that's satisfying enough. Dude, I can vividly remember the first buck I passed up when I was 14. It was a, a, you know, a nice five pointer, right? You know, it was a full five pointer. One of his brow tines were broke off. Dude, I felt like a rock star. Dude, it was okay. weird. Yeah. You know, it, it's yeah. true. You know, I just felt so good. Granted, I already had a decent buck under my belt by then. So I was like king of the world, you know. <laughs> but like, I felt so good. Dude, I still feel good when I pass up a small buck. Not, you know, because I know how important it is to let it go. And it's just like, and I always say, you know, there's exceptions. And I always tell everybody, everybody's got one time pass, man. You never kill the deer. Kill the first freaking deer that walks by. You know, whether it's a spiker or whatever, you yeah, know what I'm saying. You that's, got you got to get some blood well, under your belt, and that yeah. and that's yeah, that, blood I mean, under that your was belt. A, that was a yeah. tension too that I faced. You know, because I mean, it was three years in without having killed anything, and it was like before I I passed up with some opportunities because I I waited. I was like, oh no, I want I want a good mature deer, and then year three came along. I was like, I, don't, I I'm just at a point where like I just want to harvest something as long as it's not a spike. And actually has some decent you know, size, so I can you know, actually harvest some good. Meat. Yeah, like I'm just gonna kind of kind of take, and I'm okay with that, just because I need I need that experience. Dude, but yes, I haven't met a person. Yep. Yeah. You need there, though. You but need I haven't that met experience. a person. I haven't met a person that would not be like okay with that. Dude, like, exactly. Yeah. And it, same here. Like people, you know, I'm not trying to hard, like some sort of hardcore deer Nazi over here. <laughs> But you know what I'm saying? Like, and I'm okay. And you need that experience. You need, like I said, you need to get that blood on your hands. And yes, failure is a great teacher, right? But so is success when it comes to deer hunting. (laughs) When you come to full draw and you watch that arrow go through both of its lungs and you know what it was like to succeed, whether it was a nubbin buck or a doe or a monster buck, you're like, okay, I just got to duplicate that. And then the next time you can let that little buck walk by because you're like, I feel confident. I could kill that buck right now. Guess what? I'm going to let him go that, and I'm going to wait for that mature buck. Yes. That's you know? serious. That mentality of like, I, I had you today. Yes. And like, yes. and I'm hunting public land exclusively, at least at this point. And so, and I'm in a pretty high pressured area for some of these that I passed up and I was like, I have no idea if you're going to make it. But at the same time, oh, in that moment, I was like, I did my part. Dude, exactly. <laughs> and that's the thing is you don't know if they're going to make it. You're just like, oh Lord, please make you a little deer. You know, like this one buck <laughs> that I'm possibly going to try to kill this year, you know? Uh-huh. 
is, you know, he walked by my stand last year and I'm like, dude, you just messed up, you know, yeah. like, and then he walks circles, gets right down, wind me, wins me. I'm just like, runs right back into the bed and cover. I'm like, yes, that's what I smell like. Stay away. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> yeah. one more year, you know? So, so, so what was it? I mean, I guess let's kind of want to explore first the kind of like herd management. I mean, what, what is that experience been like you know what is the the ups the downs the highs the lows of that and then kind of want to touch a base on like on the business side of but of things but yeah so first kind of the herd management what's that been like what's that experience um well that's something we're still working on right now that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to grow our herd we're trying to get to that one buck to one doe ratio and you know and that's really not that hard to achieve I don't want to say it's not that hard, but naturally in the wild and on farms or whatever, typically the the birth rate is you're going to have a few more bucks than does. And that's because in, you know, in, in natural circumstances, bucks have such a high more mortality rate. That's the way God created deer, right? You know, a few more bucks because they die so much faster. So you're always going to have like that 50, 50 balance. And that's what we're seeing on our farm for the most part. This year we got pretty lucky. We're at like, uh, you know, we got a few more bucks than does. But that's we're, for those, as far as the herd balance, we're just trying to get that um, one buck to one doe ratio quality bucks. And that's something we're striving for right now. How close do you think you are in that? Um, you know, deer only grow so fast. <laughs> I mean, you know, how do you even like? I was gonna say, pardon, pardon the, that. pardon the pun, but how do you take stock of what's going on? Um, like a stock of how many deer you have, just in general. I think yeah. that's kind of where you're oh, going. Oh, right now, like, yeah, how? right now, it's really easy for us. Um, we we have you know we we have a a um, um, a farm where we breed deer, and we have a hunting preserve which is almost 200 acres where deer can go to live essentially. Okay. okay. So right now we're just trying to raise deer in that controlled environment, of like a farm. Okay. And to see what we're getting. Are we producing the kind of deer that we want or whatever? And are we are we getting those those good genetics and the deer having a happy, healthy life, getting good nutrition? And then when they go out to live in the massive preserve, then we'll continue to try to monitor that. You know, that weeding out the the not as good genetic ones giving them all that nutrition, all that stress-free environment and getting those deer to their maximum potential, you know? Because mm. deer live out in the wild, like I said, when I say people aren't really hunting what a deer acts like, that's because they live in such a stress-filled environment of the hunting pressure, the the predation pressure, the and that's really not natural. 500,000 gun hunters is not natural. People are like, oh, predation is natural. Well, yeah, sure that is. 500,000 gun hunters is not natural scenario. So the deer are stressed way more. Affects antler size. I mean, affects quality I get of deer. Stressed as a bow hunter when the orange army hits the woods. I'm just Dude, saying. exactly. I know. I'm just like, oh, just oh gosh. Uh, when is this nine days going to get over with? You know, like I don't mind throwing some orange on guys. No, I I love rifle. I love <laughs> rifle hunting. You know, I you know I love rifle hunting. I just get stressed out about like you know what's it gonna what's it gonna look like after the the smoke is cleared. You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, but um, but what I'm just saying is yeah. that that's not natural. People think it is or something, but no. it's not. So you're affecting the deer patterns, the movements, that natural behavior. Like I said, when was the last time you had two mature bucks fighting under your stand or grunting or you know, it's like YouTube. anything. YouTube was the last time I saw. That. <laughs> yes, e- exactly. You know, you you compare it to like anything: turkey hunting, elk hunting. Literally by the third by the third uh, week or fourth week of turkey season, turkeys aren't gobbling for a reason. They're not responding to calls for a reason. It's because of massive hunting pressure. And we want to be able to see that, you know, on private land where deer are acting like mm. deer and and we're producing the type of deer we want to see. So how do, and, and I guess this is just as far as like your experience so far, how do you balance like, um, do you find that the deer are, when we talk about comfortable, which I think is like, deer being normal is one thing but then like do you find especially raising them is there effects that you've noticed where it's like oh they're too comfortable around us or is it is that just kind of like a false like assumption that i've been making where it's like oh you're raising the deer they see you on the farm are they just really comfortable around you where it's like 
How do you, is the cha- you feel like the challenge? I, I imagine the challenge has got to be close to the same, but like, how does that? Have you noticed a difference at all? Um, it, you know, it all depends on how you raise them. But deer, they're wild, mm-hmm. and they revert back to how um, you know how they're going to be mm-hmm. nocturnal movement, you know, yeah, patterns. Yeah. Um, you know, we. We moved our yearling bucks over to this other corner to get them separate to this other um, pen area to get them separated from our yearling does from last year, and uh, right because we didn't want them like breeding each other at six months old or whatever you know. <laughs> so we Seems moved them over. We moved them over to this wooded section. All of a sudden, they're like these wild ghosts that we never see. You know, whereas when they're fawns, you know, we're going out there feeding them and this and that, and they're all kind of like walking up to us. All of a sudden, they're like, boom! Like we're in the trees now. Don't move. You, I mean, just like how a deer, you know what I'm saying? Oh, that's cool though. You know, and, but you know, on the farming aspect of farming deer, you know, you, we, we like like some of our deer to be calm. Our does, you know, we want them to be calm. We want to be able to ha- handle them. Come, we want to be able to check, you know, we're farmers too, you know? So, you know, we, when we, when I come into one of my doe pens, I want to be, I want my does to be friendly so I can look them over. Okay. There's no cuts, no whatever, you know, they're okay. Everybody's healthy and everybody looks good, you know, because you know, I'm also, I'm, I'm raising deer. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and you know, and then my bucks and my other does out in the hunting preserve, I mean, they're going to do, do whatever they want. They're going to go back to their, their wild selves. So, you know? Yeah. So what, what point maybe are you like totally hands off as yeah, far? Yeah. yeah. Like yeah, how old are they before you just send them back out or send them into the woods, not back out? Um, you, you know, it really is up to discretion of you know everybody does it a little different everybody's got a little, we you know to be honest we haven't really established a, a system of when they're going to go into the hunting preserve or whatever right we're trying to grow our herd so like some of our yearling bucks this year we want to keep them on the farm because we want to see are they going to be 200 inch typicals or are they going to be 150 inch non-typicals mm. you know do we want to get rid of this deer or do we want to keep it around? We're still building that herd of what we want, okay. you know? So is it true? Sorry, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I just, I had heard that, um, that the antler, as far as like the antler, how it turns out and how it grows, I've heard that a lot of that is determined by the doe. Is that something you've heard before or something you oh, yeah. subscribe to at all? So and then how like, do you yeah. keep track of that information? That would be, I feel like that would be a tough one. So it's kind of like my bald spot. It comes from my mother's side. No? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like my balding. Yeah. It comes from, well, it, both balding. sides bald. It's balding. coming. Balding. It's coming. Oh yeah, whatever. Dude, no, that, you could always get yeah, implants we don't need to stroke, from your beard. We don't, your head, we don't need to so, stroke you know. egos, guys. I yeah. just want to know about the beard. <laughs> you stroke beards. <laughs> Don't stroke ego, stroke beards. There There's a go. good bumper Ooh. sticker right there. Dude, you guys got to cut me in on the profits if you use that, okay? Okay, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Proprietary. Yeah. 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 Trademarked. Tra- yeah. Um, I can't remember. You, you asked something. But I can't yeah, remember. how do you keep track of? Because I've and, heard. Oh. So if, if is that true yeah. to you? Have you heard that before? Yeah. And then how do you, if, if so, how do you keep it? Keep that in line? And how do you remember or keep track um, of what's what? Or is it kind of trial and error right now? Well, I mean, it is trial and error, Mm -hmm. but you know, yeah, the genetics can come just as equally from the dough, a good solid dough as it can the buck. I mean, you know, it's the DNA, it's 50, 50, you know? So back in the day, from my understanding, you know, a lot of the the first year farmers and breeders and stuff like that were like, oh yeah, all about that antler, you know? And they're like, wait a second, it can come, you know, people call them their foundation dough. It can come from a foundation dough just as good, right? You know, like that dough carries that same trait. Right, she's got that same DNA that that monster buck that produced her had. Yeah, you know. So as a farmer, that's something we do keep track of. You know, we keep track. That's all. You know, if it's if it's not documented, it's kind of um, you know worthless in a sense. You want to be able to keep track of that. You know, if I have a doe that's on my farm and she's producing these great big bucks, well, I'm going to hold on to her and I'm going to make sure you know she doesn't get shot or something like that. You know. Yeah. So I can continue that, you know. So I and I we don't I don't know the numbers and maybe you have the numbers of what kind of deer you have on the farm now. Um, is there a point where or is there a way that they don't like crossbreed at all? Because I know even even with uh, public land animals too, I, I I've heard some some vague understandings of like 
they know at certain a certain point they won't actually breed with a certain doe. It's really it doesn't seem like there's a solid understanding. Yeah. But do you guys that are like okay, we can't have this one breed with that one or this one with that one because they're you know, sisters and brothers. You know what yep. I mean? Yeah. Most Is people that- keep track of that. Some people have experimented with what they call it line breeding. Like okay, you know, like keep it in the family for a couple generations type deal. That's where your non typicals come from. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not talking antlers. Cousin Eddie. <laughs> no, but you know, that that's, you know, it's. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, crossbreeding. Yeah. No, but yeah. Yeah. You keep track of that. You know, you, you want to make sure, uh, you know, mom and son and <laughs> you know, all that, you or know. Pump and ugly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so do and this, man, this one's going to be explicit again. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. yeah. Put that E on there. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, but you know, you, you target market. You keep track of it. You, you keep like sweet every every deer on our farm is documented. Okay, every deer we've purchased, yeah, is documented. Uh, mom, dad, granddad, grandma, you know, mm-hmm. pedigree. Yeah, right. Okay. You know, and so and then you can you can just look back and reference. I have a program on my computer, right? I can you know it's called Ranch Manager, right? You know, I can I can look oh, back nice. on it and say. Okay, um, yeah, free advertising for ranch manager. Yeah, nice. Um, no, but I can look back on it and say, you know, and be like, oh, okay, you know, this this came from this buck and this buck, you know, I'm gonna swap it over here this year so that to in you know, yeah, not do that line. Is reading. it all? Is it all ear tags that you kind of yep. keep track of everything yep. with? Yeah, okay. ear tags. Yeah, that's one of the regulations. Is uh, you know, deer have to be. Um, we tag them our personal identification, mm-hmm. and that's something that we go off of. Okay, but then we also give them a federal identification. Oh, okay. And uh, and that way, the state can keep track of them too. Oh, all right. There's a lot of regulations. I mean, every deer, you know, is is uh, it's um, tracked all across the it just state. Just needs to be accounted for. It needs to be accounted for. Yep. Interesting. So then. Um, I don't know. Do we want to hop into the, like the business, maybe a little more towards the business side of it? Yeah, like, yeah. Do you guys have thoughts? I, you, like you mentioned, you're talking, it sounds like that's kind of evolving at the moment. Mm-hmm. It sounds yep. like you're kind of, Yep. so first maybe real quick, do you have a number that's on your, would it be hunting preserve? Would that be a fair way to put it? Yeah. Now yeah. that I know a little bit more deer farm. Yeah. Like hunting preserve guys. Yeah. Yeah. Hunting ranch. We nice. Call them. Sweet. Okay. Hunting ranch. Even better. This is, yeah. this yeah. is enlightening. Yeah. So do you know how many deer are on that? Yeah, I mean, right now on our farm, we have, I mean, uh, we've had 21 fawns. I just had two more fawns today. This year, I've got like 30 mature deer. Nice. So, yeah, I've, you know, including fawns, you know, it's like, f- you know, 50, 50 some deer or something. Okay, you know. Dude, that's awesome. I mean, I have it exactly written down. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. It's like yeah. 50 some no, deer. ballpark, yeah. it's great. Yep. Um, is there a point at which the land can't sustain those animals? Oh yeah, for sure. So what, do you know what that point is as far as numbers? Not necessarily. Okay. But I mean, you know, you, you want to, you want your land to be able to sustain your animals. And that's honestly pretty easy to tell the browse, the grass, the, you know, are they getting enough nutrition? Are you suddenly have to supplement feed a lot? Mm-hmm. You know, um, herd stress, you know, I mean, it, you know, deer can get a little bit stressed out if the, um, the environment is getting too crowded, right? They need their space a little bit, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's all things that you can go, go, you know, go with as you go. The nice thing is about this industry too, is there's people who have been out there doing it 20, 30, 40 years, and they're only a phone call away. That's pretty cool. Dude, everybody. Is it pretty friendly? Oh my gosh, dude. The deer industry not making this up. There is no competition. Hmm. Everybody is there to help everybody else. Not just saying that. It's crazy, dude. I call up this guy who's got 40 some years of deer fight. He grows some of the biggest deer. You know, he's got this massive hunting ranch out in Ohio. It's like, you know, 2000 acres and all this and that, you know, kind of a, you know, a big shot, right? You know, he's been doing it forever. Dude, I, here I am just like wet behind the ears. I just call him up out of the blue, like asking for advice. And we sit on the phone for like an hour and a half, you know, and he just tells you everything you need to know. There's no secrets. It's like, Oh, you want to grow big bucks? You want to imagine them this way? Oh, when you put them out on your hunting preserve, you want to do this. And if you get too many does, you want to do this. And you, you know, this is, I mean, there's, like I said, there's no competition. It's crazy. Dude, you can talk to people for hours on end because they just, people want to help you. And it's a growing industry. Mm-hmm. There's no competition. Dude, everybody, you know, wants you to have deer. People want to buy deer and, and 
you know, the 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 way that people reach out to you or are willing to help you out is it's pretty crazy. I'm not, you know. Well, that's nice. It is. It is. It's really is really something. So that's yeah. pretty awesome. Yeah. So with as as this herd is growing, I mean, are you guys currently do providing hunts? You know. No. Okay. So yeah, what I mean, does that look like then in the future? Or kind of how are you? What is your hopes to grow that into? That's exactly what we're going for. Okay, we want to provide quality hunts for people, and 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 not just hunts, but in all inclusive package, right? You know, we want you to come, stay, eat, drink, and have a good time. Be merry and right. be merry exactly, <laughs> and and draw some blood, you know. And so that's what we're all about. That's what we are growing this into Mm -hmm. because, you know, and not only is that what we want to do, we, like I said, you hunt and fish your whole life and it comes to the point where you just want to be involved in it 24 seven to the point of where I want to take other people hunting. I want to share this experience with other people and give them an experience of a lifetime and, and and do that you know and you also have to do that because you got you got to make some money back right to pay for all yeah the, everything yeah <laughs> Dude, <laughs> you know you know what it's like just occurring me occurring to me too is like when i think of making something like special and and a lot of times when i think of deer or uh hunting ranches i i just i have the negative thought but then as you're like kind of describing it and like your thought and your hope for it like right that came to my mind as you were saying that i was like oh my dad Cause from the age that any of us were able, I mean, before I was born, there's 10 kids in our family. I'm number eight, I think still. And, uh, and when I think of like wanting an experience, a special thing, it's my dad has given up, like essentially given up a serious hunt every single year to further uh, our experience. Yeah. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then to like, think of something like this, where it's like, we know there's quality animals there. We know it's still hunting experience. Mm-hmm. And then give him an opportunity because he's always been like praying and thinking about that big buck. And like every yeah. year it's always like, I'm just praying for that big buck this year. And he's, he is getting up there in age. Let's just say that. And, yeah. and, uh, I think something like that, like with those circumstances to me, it's like, oh man, that actually would be really special. Right. It, it yeah. would be dude, because you know, it's all in the eye of the beholder. It really is. You know, people think, oh, high fence hunting ranch. Like you said, they have these negative, Why? Well, well, you know, if you want to go, what's your definition of free, you know, uh, fair chase or whatever it's called, you know, you, you know, why, why not? You know, if yeah. you want to come do it, then why not? If you don't want to do it, then don't do it. Well, you I know? kind of wonder, is, cause I've been thinking about this a lot as you're talking, like, this is like really, really kind of cool getting this, this shift in perspective on a, a deer ranch, you know, and, and seeing it from a business and, um, conservation and agriculture side, like oh, so this is actually a really viable and sustainable option, and it totally makes sense. And I've kind of wondered, like, if this negative connotation really comes from kind of the these these TV shows, especially in the '90s and early 2000s, where these hunters were going out and using these farm ranches, which are a good thing, but using it to almost just pimp um, product and, and their yeah. name and recognition. Yep. And whereas like, and because of that association and rather than like yes. people looking at it going, Oh, well, well X, Y, and Z, that guy and this horrible like way of doing it gave such a bad image to the overall like goodness of what you're doing. Like, cause when I hear you talking about the raising healthy deer, like who, what person, whether you're a hunter or anti hunter isn't for healthy animal, population exactly and, and, and it's not like you're you're raising a bunch of deer in a crowded barn and and, and letting yeah. them out and and leading Put, it to putting its, it into yeah. a cr- yeah. corral and then <laughs> yeah, like, all so right take your shots boys yeah all you're doing exactly. is raising yeah. really healthy deer and then releasing them into the wild and then hunting them naturally within you know yeah a certain, certain distance like that actually sounds really good and so it's like man it's like what have we we done well, you touched on a couple of points on that, and one of them was like when you said the, the early '90s when some of these DVDs were coming, and a couple guys, and I, I can't even remember a couple of their names, not that necessarily I would say, but back then did get busted, busted quotation marks, you know, breaking it up, but they were on a hunting ranch and they got caught, and it kind of sent their hunting careers plummeting a little bit. So then it gives it this, oh man, he well, if they would have been just honest about it in the yeah. first place, there's a lot of hunting shows now. 
or I should, yeah, quite a few actually, where they're like, yeah, we're out on this ranch out here on Texas or Wisconsin or Pennsylvania. You know, it's this 2,000 acre high fence or 500 acre or whatever. And guess what? I mean, they're honest about it and probably not a whole lot of people giving them grief, Yeah, you know, yeah. versus people who are like trying to cover it up, you know, and yeah, you're going to have bigger deer and you're gonna, your chances are going to be higher because you are managing it perfectly, yeah. essentially. You know, and, and like I said, there's a lot of things out of your control. I don't mean to repeat the same things, but things that are out of your control that the state won't let you do. So then you turn to the high fence option, the hmm. the predators, you know, the, the, the tags they give out. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't give out that many doe tags or I wouldn't allow this or that. So then you put up a high fence and you manage your property the way you best see fit. But I think like if I can play devil's advocate with some of those, those thoughts, I think mm-hmm. that, I mean, you think about going from a rifle to a compound bow or a rifle to a crossbow or right. And then from crossbow to a compound bow and then from a compound bow to a trad bow. It, it part of it, I think too, is like when I hunt public land, like I take a lot of pride in overcoming a lot of those obstacles. And then yeah. I'm personally putting, I'm putting my own obstacles in place when I start using a different killing machine weapon or whatever it might be. Right. Like yep. if, and you know, does he go into a trad bow? Like that's a huge deal. That's a huge obstacle, massive. Right. And so I think part of it too, is that I mastered the compound. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, what else is there to do? <laughs> it's a slam dunk three years later. <laughs> But but honestly, I think that that's part of it too. I mean, you see the industry now, just as, as in the hunting industry as a whole, where it's like these people that want to push it harder, further, and and like they they fully recognize like those challenges and they like take them on, and and it gives them, and this maybe plays um, kind of to your point about like to each his own more or less. Where it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, well, if that's yeah. rewarding for you, great, you know, like have at it. You know, if, if Dustin wants to go to trad bow and I stick with a compound bow. Have at it. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think that there's a, there's like a natural, at least I think I'm, you know, coming from the, just the layman's here where it's like, oh, you got that behind a fence. It doesn't mean as much. Like if I look at it, yeah. someone my age, able-bodied and it's like, oh, well, yeah, well, I could go kill that buck too if I went in that fence. That's yeah. how I feel. Yeah. Like that's, that's what I think is like the, uh, the, the natural thought that people go to. I think so too. People do. People who want to push harder, you know, go the distance, carry a longbow instead of a rifle, you know, the Cameron Haynes wannabe, you know. My uh, teeth aren't that white, man. Yeah. <laughs> Nor do I love running. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you know what I'm saying? And, and like I said, it's to each their own. Mm-hmm. But what really gets under my skin is people who want to outlaw it. Mm. Okay, that's what we're getting a huge pushback on right now. Right now, and is that it, statewide or county? Most well, national. It, national. Okay, but we're feeling a lot right now, like county, and people want to. But why? 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 You know, it's it's a freak. If you want to do it and you don't, then why not? And so, what are the da- what are what are they saying are the downfalls? What's their perspective? Well, they're using the CWD epidemic as you know the tool of hot button, of why hot button, it shouldn't be. Hot yeah, button, yeah, hot button, hot button. And Ethan wants to push it. Yeah, yeah I just hit the hot button like six <laughs> times. So, what's their their thought process? I'm assuming you've had to listen to it. Is oh that, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so what's their thought press and thought process, and where do you see it? not aligning with maybe accuracy in your mind well um the whole thought process is long people who the boone and crockett club types elitists um who who like you said people who are like well i don't like high fence hunting yeah i don't i just don't don't subscribe to that so it's bad (laughs) exactly you know it's like i said my grandpa he he wants rapala's outlawed well, can he just not use Rapala's? Okay. <laughs> it doesn't seem reasonable. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, and I use that as an example, you know, love my grandpa. Just saying, using that as an example, it, you know, people, I don't like it, so I want it gone. Mm-hmm. That, that it's the mentality. I don't like high fence hunting and I feel like that guy is cheating, so I want it gone. Okay. So that doesn't make any sense because... I mean, it, like I keep saying, to each their own, right? You know, so now what's come about is the CWD epidemic 
And so people who are on that bandwagon of I want it gone, you know, jumped on the bandwagon. This is what I believe anyways. Mm -hmm. This is not... I'm not preaching this as fact, but this That's is what okay. I believe. Yeah. They That's jumped what on that. Just your thoughts. They they jumped on that bandwagon of I want it gone to oh CWD. It's coming from them. So now we really need it gone. We really need it gone because CWD. And you know why? You know why it's coming from them is because there's too many deer in a small space. That that was the science behind it. That was the literal science behind. It. There's too many deer. They're crowded. They're unhealthy. And now they're spreading CWD to the rest of the world. Right. So CWD as of right now, first of all, it sounds like you, do you believe in CWD? Oh yeah, Because there's people absolutely. who are total naysayers, right? I'm not Yeah, there are there are some weird people out there that believe it, that, yeah. It's just totally, man. <laughs> it's the government, man. It's the, <laughs> yeah. It's the insurance companies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. There, there, too many cars are hitting them. They're paying out. Yeah. There's, seriously, that's like some people's stance. Um, yeah. So CWD, if I understand it correctly, is transmitted from one saliva basically, right? It's transmitted through a plethora of ways. Okay. I mean, you're talking soil, dirt contact, eagle poop, coyote poop, saliva, blood, um, less likely urine. Um, it's it's through plant life. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's why it's like Jeez. the craziest thing ever wow. is because it can get transmitted all these different ways. And so anyways, the naysayers, they want to say that it's coming from deer farms with real no proof to back it up. And as science, now that CWD has been around since, well, it was discovered anyways, who knows how long it's been around 1957 or 1958, you know, as more science comes out and comes out and comes out, well, it's very obviously not a deer farmer's fault. It's not necessarily anybody's fault. It's a disease and it's out there and it affects deer. Mm -hmm. And, you, and the people it affects the most are the people who have the most vested into it, a.k.a. hunting ranches, deer farmers. Mm. You know, so for us, you know, we take it pretty seriously. Yeah, so so they're, so they're coming at you. They're challenging the idea of, of having a hunting ranch, right? Mm -hmm. And then what's your response to that? How do you, how do you start to build a case and, you know, that it's not just, it's not you guys primarily. It's like everybody's dealing with it, right? Would that be fair? Yes. Everybody's dealing with yeah. it. Yeah. So, so what's your kind of response to those people? Maybe, I don't know if that's a, well, yeah, well, posed I guess, question or not, but yeah, yeah just cause I'm kind of, I'm, I'm curious cause I have literally no clue about any of the signs or stats behind CWD other than kind of what I see or hear here and there, you know, I mean, the one thing I do know is like, Obviously, the, the uh, white tail population is it's at its highest it's ever been historically. Exactly, than, it is higher uh, than ever in recorded than, history. Um, you know when um, they we first were here. So, I mean, that's gotta. I would imagine that has to probably play a part in it. That there's just kind of an overpopulation, period. Or what? What is your thing? Well, your the science shows that density has nothing to do with CWD. Okay, from what they know. Um. Density has nothing to do with it um, mutating or spontaneously appearing. But density could play a role as far as if you have like a bunch of deer close by, it might spread faster Kinda, to yeah, each other because they're in closer gun. But that's spread. That's not the origin of the disease, right? You know? So, yeah, we have like the healthiest, best deer herd in American like recorded history right now. So, I mean... That that to me that's only a good sign. CWD or not? Yeah, you know. Um, well, what's crazy is is that like the only um, there hasn't been any cure for it. Like there was not too long ago, someone was like, "Oh, if you give them antibiotic, you know, we found this perfect strain mm -hmm. of antibiotics." That it's earlier like earlier this year or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it yeah. And, yeah. and it was just it's total. It's, total it's not it's nothing to, yeah. really substantial that would actually help it out. And the only thing that I think that. Oh, I forget which country it was that was doing it, but essentially they were trying to. It wasn't deer. I want to say it was caribou. Maybe. Yeah, it was caribou. Nor yeah, were they, Norway or yeah, Sweden? Yeah, yeah, which one? Yeah. I get all of them confused. I want to know. say Norway, but maybe I I'm think Scandinavia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's all the same. But over but there. their their approach has been to try to eradicate yep. the animals, kill them, and then bury them, and like just separate everything, Jeez. and like yeah. just totally eradicate it, and and to just kill everything. And that's maybe what, that'll work, but probably unlikely. Right. And, and so that's what's crazy about this whole thing with us. It's like, are we, I mean, even blame it. Mean, what, what, what good is, what good? I, I don't know how effective 
going, oh, the deer farms are the problem. When you, I mean, you can watch it every year, work up the map towards northern uh, Wisconsin from you know the lower parts, yeah. and it just keeps working its way up because people send their deer to get tested. And yes. it's like, oh, we got confirmed, 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 and it's like they're just running around on farms down there, not deer farms, just farms. There's like a lot around. of them are exactly. just yeah, and they're, and they're the CWD rate is much higher in wild animals. Okay, it's silly. It's absolutely nonsense. When somebody tries to say it's spreading from farms, it's coming from farms. Okay, you've got a handful of farms all across the state, another handful all across the country, right? But yet CWD is by far more prevalent in the wild. Okay. So how do they, I guess, so what's the... So so let's back up real quick. So for like myself and a lot of the other listeners, I mean, what is CWD? I mean, and how does it, what does it affect? You know, what is... What does it do and kind of, yeah, what what's happening there? Just so, yeah, kind of give us. A Ethan, story. are you Googling? I'm Googling. Are you, are you Googling uh, words uh, I can't pronounce? Yes, I am, sir. <laughs> Chronic wasting disease. So it's a word I can't pronounce. Sponge, <laughs> sponge, uh, you know. <laughs> it's a neurolo- it's, yeah, exactly. It's a neurological disease, yeah. right? Attacks. The, it comes in through the, the prion. It attacks the brain. It literally, the word sponge is in there because it turns your brain, the brain into a sponge. Okay, so it's a bit of a slow moving disease, but then once it once it gets in there, it you know it goes through several stages. Either way, the re- the end result is death. It always is. Yeah, there's you'll no see way around. odd. You'll see odd behavior, and yeah, be like, and that's in the final some, stage. Yeah, there's a, some tells. A deer but. could be having CWD. It could have contracted it for several months. Looks perfectly healthy. It's had it for months, and that's the weird part, you know, because yeah. then they could be walking around spreading it to other deer. But, but, you know, it's, it's had it for several months. And then all of a sudden the final stage is boom. You know, its brain is literally getting holes eaten through it. So now it's not scared of humans. It's stumbling around. It's ribs. You know, it's losing weight because it's not eating the way it should. It's drooling, you know, and then it dies. I've heard they can go for years without showing. Possibly. possibly. I would have to check that. Yeah. But it is a long time. But that is the upside of CWD. Whoa. Did I just say upside of CWD? You sure did. Oh, man. You know. I'm serious, so you know, pe- pe- <laughs> people think you're crazy if you say that. But that is the upside in the fact that, okay, and the reason why we're not seeing CWD affect populations, people would literally shoot me if they heard me say that, <laughs> is the reason why we're not seeing that is because a deer can be born, get bred, have CWD, have fawns, not pass it on to the fawns, hmm. and die of CWD. So... I mean, it is really the upside that it's such a slow moving disease mm. that that's why we're not seeing this massive rapid progression this rapid thing. it's not like EHD, okay? When EHD hits literally like you know, seventy percent of the deer herd dies, it's you dead, walk out dead. there, you know, you see Bill Winky and Lee Lakoski out there walking around like, oh crap, there's another two hundred buck inch buck dead and another one and another one, another one. That's why we're not seeing that with mm. CWD is because they literally have time to reproduce before hmm. they die and that that isn't i mean that's an upside in my book anyways so here's a question um so you have to take stock of all these animals they're they're looked at as stock right like basically yeah. like, yep. a, like you would assume like a cow that's why you deal with agriculture yeah okay so how often or what's the the thought process coming from these people who are saying this is the main problem this is where it's primarily coming from i mean do you have a lot of deer escaping because there if it's your problem in your in your hunting ranch there, mm-hmm. isn't it just going to affect your deer? Like what, what's the thought process behind that? Cause if they're, if it's just affecting your deer and you're not letting them go or you're ki- ending up killing them, wh- are they just, what's their, what's their fight against that? Or what's their battle? I mean, I don't get it. If they're all in that place. Um, well, that's a lot behind that question. <laughs> um, whoops. But, <laughs> um, you know, any deer that has CWD has the possibility of spreading it somehow. It might not be contact with another deer. It might be, you know, through... The, and there, there's a lot of things they don't know, like when the deer starts shedding um, the disease, you know, and, and the different ways they shed it. You know, like, is it in, in, only in the late stages? Is it early on in the stages? Mm-hmm. Right, so the, the concern is, say, an area has... A deer has CWD or whatever... Um, you know, it could be through hair, saliva contact, you know, urine. Urine goes into a crick. It goes down there. The, pri- the m- tiny, tiny little prion, you know, is attached to a stick in that crick, and it carries on to that one. I mean, there's so many ways. Mm. So to say, like, oh, we can keep it in one area uh. is kind of hard to do that. <laughs> 
to an extent, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. But, you, I mean, so we, we know that CWD can spread and there's things we can do to stop the spread. But the real question is, what can we do to stop the disease? But this is yeah. this is interesting. So what I had heard from uh, some of the quote unquote leading guys from the CWD like research field is that part of why we don't have to worry about it as humans consuming it, at least up to this point, right? Because we don't know what could come up. But is that like questions things, about you? Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm starting to drool over here. No, but um, like coyotes, like coyotes don't have CWD. Yeah. Like it's that prion that you're talking about is not actually compatible. Like it doesn't work to them. Yeah. But are you saying that at least is like your understanding is even through their poop, it can still be transmitted? I believe so. Okay. Yeah. And so they, they are not a, contracting and then, and then grow, it. Then grow up in a plant type and of thing? then grow up in a plant or something like that. Okay. Jeez. That's the different ways it could, it could spread. You know, Joe Blow is down there four wheeling. In CWD country, he gets a bunch of mud on his tires where the prion exists, and he comes up here, flings up over here, and it just so happens that a deer comes in contact with that. Hmm. You know, yeah, that's there's the possibility of it if it transmitting that way. Hmm. You know, it it's kind of crazy. You that know, is, this is so like there's so many places you can go with this. It, like yeah, it's it's, it's, yeah, it's, am- it's I mean it's amazing. Like, do you feel like the main fight, the main front for them is deer, like deer ranches, deer hunting ranches, front like, for, for the people who are against, like who are trying to stop CWD? Is that like because I I think yeah, of that, like the vast the research or just more the the social media voices trying to shut things down? Because like the va- the vast I would imagine the vast uh, the vast amount of land in Wisconsin is public or not public, but uh, rather not a deer ranch or a deer. Yes. So, but that's the main beef? But that's the main beef is that it's coming from us with zero proof behind that. You know you know what I'm saying, right? So they're saying it's coming from us with, with zero scientific evidence behind that. And I mean, like I've said before, it, CWD is, is more prevalent in the wild herd, right? So, I, I don't I don't understand where where their argument is is necessarily coming from, you know, and, and the chance that it's coming from a hunt these limited amount of hunting ranches and stuff is so minute. Yeah, you know, but um, um, I lost my my train of thought there. So, are, do you personally face a lot of? <laughs> Direct opposition or yes. people arguing against with you and kind of in person or whatnot because of what you're doing. Um, right now we're we're facing quite a bit of opposition, and you know, it, 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 and like I said, they're using CWD as a tool. Yeah, I believe they're using that as a tool. Um, they say they're afraid of it. They say that you know they don't want the spread. Right? Nobody wants it to spread. Yeah. Nobody. Wa- like I've said before, no, it doesn't affect anybody more than a deer farmer. Yeah. Okay, because we have everything invested into these deer. Yeah. Time, love, energy, money, everything. Right. So we do not. You know, it it doesn't affect anybody more than us. Yeah. You know, and uh, dang it. If I could stay on that thought. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, is that a lot of? Is there a lot of local opposition to what you're doing? Yeah, there you is. That, or I'm there just... is local opposition. You know, um, one thing I want to touch on too with that is the the measures we go through to protect ourselves from something like CWD. Yeah. You know. Um, there's so many regulations in place to ensure that deer farms don't spread it, right? Because they can say, you know, it springs up from a deer farm or whatever. We know that's not true. We know there's something, there's another piece to the puzzle that scientists are still looking for to why it occurs, how it does, you know, because it's occurring in, in at random, in random places, right? Yeah. Like this moose in Norway comes up with CWD. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm sure a deer farm spread it to that moose in Norway, you know? <laughs> So um, there's a lot of things we are doing to protect ourselves, and the, we follow the rules of the Department of Ag. We test 100% of our deer deaths, okay? 
deer in the wild are being tested at like 1%. Mm. Okay. So that's something we do to just protect ourselves, make sure we know we're clean, make sure we know we're not going to spread something to the wild herd or to another, say we sell a deer from our ranch to somebody else. You know, we have to have that certification legally yeah. to, to make sure that, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to be the cause of something, mm-hmm. you know, the cause of a spread or, or, or whatever, you know? Yeah. So, I mean. Dude, that's intense. That's a lot that goes into that. That is like the, like probably the weediest thing to get into is CWD right now, just yeah. with the deer. And, it but, is. But I think, I think one thing that's cool is just at least getting the opportunity to hear firsthand about like your personal like endeavors and struggles with that one the the public the public uh, impression of what a, a deer farm would be and then also the things you're doing to prevent it and like you said you're checking every you, know, you guys are checking every death and i mean to me, I, I've had like my just my general, you know, having received it from probably social media and the you real know. people who are like, you know, crying wolf at, you know, yeah. oh, it's a deer farm because they're all right there, you know. And so my I guess my thoughts have shifted a little bit and you're starting to balance out the the, the huge wave of negative information coming in from the deer farm side of it. You dude, dude, like I compare it to the. Uh oh. I compare it to the uh, Donald Trump Russia investigation. <laughs> okay, it's that crazy. It's off the charts. Okay, like we all look at the cable TV and we're like, really seriously? Like, does anybody believe this? You know, that's how I feel a lot of times when I read the the outdoor news and this and that. You know, like. Oh, you know, the sky is falling, you know, ah, you know, and it's all deer farms, you know, and all this craziness. And you're like, science people just get back to the basics, you know, and these people that believe that, um, you know, the deer farms and the the hunting preserves should be um, outlawed. Well, we can, we can look at what's already taken place. Okay. Wyoming back in 1991, I believe it was, they said, Hey, we're going to get out ahead of this, this CWD thing. We're going to outlaw um elk farms and all that right you know and uh so this is 91 so we're talking how many years ago well i that's the year i was born so 27 oh nice we didn't even have to do math yeah (laughs) so so anyways 27 years ago they say we're gonna get rid of that yeah we're gonna go ahead of this okay so there's not a single deer farm in the state of wyoming well they have cwd in almost every single county oh geez okay so pretty obvious (laughs) Yeah. It's not coming, and there was only a couple in the state to start with, I, I believe. You know, now you look at Texas, who welcomes deer farmers, hunting ranches with open arms. Do they have exotics, all this yeah. crazy stuff? Right? Yeah, you know, they have like twelve hundred and some registered deer farms, Jeez. right? You know, Big, everything's and, bigger in Texas. <laughs> everything's bigger in Texas, man. But you know, they've had CWD. I believe Texas was the third state to to find it in in a in a deer. So here we are from like the 60s or whenever it was they found it in their state to present day. They have 1,200 and some deer farms, not to mention other exotics and things like that. You know, they still only have CWD in five counties. Wow. So draw the dots on the map there for me and try to tell me that it's coming from deer farms. You know, it's it's obviously not. And the more we find out about CWD, is we're finding how soil related it is. Hmm. And that has a big role to play in it is the, the type of soil and what's in the soil. And that's that's new research that, uh, I mean, I'm not going to go into depth about because I don't want to get in way over my head. But that is, <laughs> that's something big that they're working on right now. And and this is these are the pieces of the puzzle we need to put together to solve this CWD mystery rather than just saying, it comes from deer farms. Oh my gosh, you know, close them down. Well, okay, I tell people this. If every single deer farm in Wisconsin was gone tomorrow, where would we be at with CWD? Well, it's at a at a testing rate of 50 to 100% on all hunting ranches and farms. Deer test at a 0.02% positive CWD. Hmm. Okay, right? Right now there's like 12 ranches or farms across the whole state that have tested positive. Mm-hmm. Currently. Okay. Now, I'm not talking in the past. Yeah. Okay, so testing at 50 to 100% because hunting ranches only need to test 50% by, by law. 
farms need to test at 100%. The, the test rate is 0.02%. Okay, testing at like 1% to 2% of the thousands and thousands of deer that are killed by hunters every year, the, the test results that they do bring in. Yeah. Okay, wild deer are testing at a 0.04% positive rate. So double that of what's on farms testing at only one percent one percent maybe two wow. so and <laughs> and like i said it's much higher in the wild herd okay there's five states right now that don't even have a, a farm servant okay it's called farm servant industry there's cwd there hmm. okay versus i take that back that's states that don't have a farm servant industry there's eight states where cwd is only found in the wild population wow versus yeah three states where it's found in only farmed populations. So like I said, try to tell me that it's coming from farms. I don't know. You're, you know, you're. So basically it boils down to, we just really don't know where or why yet. We don't, we need to keep putting. And we're looking for a scapegoat. (laughs) Thank you. We're looking for a scapegoat. That's, that's what it comes down to, you know, and we're looking for the scapegoat. People love to point fingers. You know, it's, you know, uh, Brian Richards, um, probably are familiar with the name. He was on the Joe Rogan podcast. Oh, yeah. Yep. So um, he, 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 you know, leading, um, what would you call it? Expert. research, yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's he, who he, I listen to. Yeah. He'll say, um, you know, the number one cause is from hunter carcass transportation, right? Ooh, yep. Yeah. Hunters yeah. dragging carcasses, thousands of carcasses all over the place every single year, right? Well, when they tried to pass a law of... Well, farms should have mandatory double fencing to try to prevent that deer on deer contact, you know, but also hunters need to leave their carcass in the county of which it was harvested. Major uproar. No, we can't do that. We can't leave the carcass. We need to put it in the back of our pickup bed and bring it home and cut it up. And there are, there are some, there are some places where that is now mandatory too. It is. Yeah. yeah. That's finally becoming a thing after years and years. But what I'm saying, finally the hunter participation is starting to come into effect. You know, certain hunter groups are starting to say, Okay, let's start buying. If the state's not going to do it, we're going to buy dumpsters and put them on the corner for people to put yep. their carcass in. Yep. So, but this is something that the farming industry has been doing for years, mm-hmm. chasing this research and chasing these solutions. And it's taken decades for everybody else to get on board with it. I mean, I know farmers that are dumping thousands of dollars, personal money, into this research. They're sacrificing their most valuable deer as um, you know, lab rats basically yeah. wow. to try to find a solution to this. Hmm. So deer farmers are doing their part and it's time for honestly, everybody else to step up their game. And that really is true. And I, I believe people are, yeah. but, but people need to continue to step up the game I and quit just trying to point fingers and say, well, we're not going to do that, but they should have to do that. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. If you actually care about the issue, everybody's going to elevate their game a little bit. And like I said, we were at, you know, our wow, our white tails of Wisconsin spring banquet this year. And you should see, people are so generous, man. They're just, they want to find a solution, not a, oh, well, we need to monitor it and we need to stop the spread. No, we want to find a solution. Yeah. Dude, people are throwing thousands of dollars and time and energy and into this to find a solution, not just say, well, you know, if we... Uh, you know, don't spread the carcasses and, you know, and, and maybe if we kill all the deer in a county, it won't come back. Well, it's in the soil, so it's going to come back. That's why we need to find a solution, you know, but anyways. Man. Woo! Uh, so this, I, I, think, I think we can keep going a, yeah, a, yeah. a, a oh, lot yeah. longer than this, but this kind of actually reminds me of a, a quote from Donnie Vincent that I actually just listened to yesterday, listening to a podcast where he was talking about hunting and this idea of conservation and how you know sometimes you know hunting isn't like if we're really passionate about hunting sometimes it's not about killing the animals sometimes like it might get to the point he's like i just being so passionate about the animals that i'm willing to lay down my guns lay down my bows and pick up the tools to help create healthy you know herds of animal healthy cultures yes. of animals and this kind of kind of a very appropriate um quote for this kind of situation Dude. that maybe it's one of those scenarios that it's, it's tough because yeah because we think of hunting and we just want to we just want to kill 
Dude, you know? yeah. I can't believe you just pulled that. Did you just pull that out of thin air? That quote, that's pretty good. But um, that was Donnie. No, that was, that was, that was, you know, that was, that you're exactly right. You know, um, you know, we we just think about killing, but it's just as rewarding in the off season to be putting in those food yeah. plots, managing those deer, helping those deer out. You know, I mean, that's that's why we got into it because that off season work is so rewarding as well you know, and managing it. And we just took it to the next step and wanted to do it on our own property, our own way, hmm. you know, so. That's pretty awesome. That's admirable. Dude, man, that was, yeah, my, my, my mind's blown right now. I've got a lot to reprocess through on my perceptions of things in life and whatnot. And deer farms <laughs> life itself, and deer I just need to yeah. rethink. Life existence. No, <laughs> I think, uh, man, I think it's probably a good place to to uh, pause this conversation. Yeah. I say pause intentionally yeah, because we're, we got to do another. Yeah, another and we're hoping that too. like yeah. get your brother this has on. Been, yeah, absolute blast. And I think you and having you and Quinn here is going to be just super a oh, ton of fun. And there's a lot of subjects to cover too. Oh, and, and I mean, yeah. even CWD, we could go on for another hour probably. Dude, that's the killer part. You could go. <laughs> From management to CWD to you know, and that's why it's like my brain like shorts out sometimes because I'm like Quinn. Do you have CWD? Yeah, yeah, dude. And that's the other thing, dude. You could go on to the you know the fact that humans can't you know contract it and stuff, and that's a huge tactic that the people you know the anti deer farmers are saying you know ah people are gonna get it blah blah blah. Well, well, there's no recorded case yet, right? No, not yet. Anyway, not to open another. Yeah, so. Um, do you guys have like, what's the, the company name? I know you're still growing long Lake outfitters, long Lake outfitters. Yes. Yep. Okay. And yep. do you guys have a projected time or are you just kind of feeling it out at this moment? Just feeling it out this okay. moment. Okay. Uh, we're shooting for three and a half year old bucks. Okay. And quality quantity, you know, we want people to get the full experience. So we don't want to, we don't want to shortcut anything. That's awesome. Nice. Well, yeah. I mean, I think that, uh, we will have a ongoing growing relationship as far as, I mean, I'm definitely going to be interested in growing our relationship with you and, and even yeah, your, your business that you guys have going on. I think it'll be awesome to get the word out there dude. and uh, give a fresh perspective on something that I know that I have been in. I needed. Uh, yeah. This is you definitely needed. a new, a new light <laughs> shed on this for me. So yeah. um, I'm sure next time we get together, I'll have a lot more questions and maybe some counterpoints or maybe some counter questions to some of the statements and stuff. Um, but yeah, that's dude. awesome. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I brought in some paperwork material you know, and stuff. And why don't you guys think I was a total nerd? Dude, so. no, that's what we're into. Don't worry, we're <laughs> total nerds getting, here. Like, I know. just messed with you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'll, br I'll bring this stuff just in case. But <laughs> this is like, you know, 10 hours worth of data right here. So I'm like, you know what? We'll, probably we'll just shoot from the hip. Tonight, yeah, this, you know? yeah, I'm sure as, as time goes on, we're going to be able to uh, tackle a lot of those exactly, things. That'll right, be awesome. Right, yeah, yeah. This. So yeah, I'm looking forward to like this being just an ongoing thing as the years goes on here. If, yeah, if you're up for that. So Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, well, I guess we'll wrap up. Dusty, where yeah. can they find us? I was just going to ask you, Ethan. Where nope, can too late. Um... <laughs> You can find us at every other location you've been able to find us at before. If this is your first time, we are on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, iTunes, Podbean, and some other weird, funky download places <laughs> that I've never heard of because I'm not that hipster millennial. Yeah, <laughs> we, we have links in our bio if you check us out yeah, on uh, check out Facebook or Instagram. Tree. It's the best place. Yep, and you'll be all set. So thanks for joining us, guys. And Cade, thanks for coming in today. Thanks, guys. It was, guys. It was awesome. Yep. Cool. All right. All right. We'll see you guys later. Thanks for joining. Peace, Peace out. out.